Why can't this wait? Why can't this wait till tomorrow? Why did this have to happen now? Why doesn't God answer my prayers? Why is the pastor still speaking? It's time for lunch. Why don't my children listen to me? Why won't anyone help me? Why do I constantly have anxiety? Why? Why do I have anxiety? Why is my still speaking? Why is the most powerful word in the world? Did, did I hear that thing say, why is the preacher still talking? Is that what I heard? <laughs> Who put that together? <laughs> I think it's awesome. Listen, we're going we're gonna to dig into a series. Guess what it's called? Why? It's one of the uh, most important things we can talk about. Let me, let me start with a story, though. When Debbie and I were appointed to a church, we were appointed, uh, first time as the lead pastor, we were appointed to a church in Metter. And uh, some of my, you, you guys know where Metter is, right? Most people do. Because in Metter, everything's better, we say. They say. That's what they say, anyway. Anyway, I was appointed there, and uh, so some friends of mine said, hey, what church are you going to? Which Methodist church in Metter? I'm like, the Methodist church. There's only one. Well, we, we had a great time there. Good friends, still good friends of ours. We love them to death. But there was a favorite place we would eat. It was called uh, IHS Pharmacy, downtown Metter. If you ever go, it's got some good food there. You can stop in and get something. So uh, Debbie and I love to, to uh, eat there. And so we're sitting there one day enjoying lunch at uh, this, this pharmacy. And Debbie says, oh, my gosh, are you seeing what I'm seeing? And I look up, and all these people are running to the windows at this uh, uh, pharmacy where the uh, restaurant is. And, and they're looking out into the parking lot. And what we see is this bull, and the bull is coming through the parking lot, and he's got this gate on his head, like an iron gate stuck on his head. It's, here's what happened. Apparently, this bull was on his way to the market or somewhere else, and he didn't like to go there, so the farmer was pulling him in the trailer, and he somehow got his head stuck through the gate with his horns and uh, busted out. And so he's running through town now with this gate on his head. Debbie... Uh, jumps up to go outside with her phone, and, you know, it's one of those, you know what I'm talking about? It's a <laughs> flip phone, and she goes out to try to get a picture, but unfortunately she was not fast enough to get it. But behind the bull with the, with the gate on its head was the fire truck. Behind the fire truck was the chief of police in his police car. Behind the chief of police was the sheriff, Homer Bell, in his sheriff's car. And then behind the, I think the mayor was behind him, and the last was the local vet. He was in the last vehicle. And, we, and here they came through the parking lot, all of them. It's like a parade. We were like, this is, this is amazing. Only in Metter could you find a bull running through town with a gate on its head. Well, I'll come back to that story in just a few minutes. But here, here's what we're doing. We're in this series called Why. You're probably wondering why I even told you that story. Why is about who we are and why we do what we do as followers of Jesus Christ. Um, we're going to start today with Why Me. Here's what I want you to think about here. Why is the most powerful word in any language? Fill in that blank if you got your blanks. You want to fill those in. Why is the most powerful word? Because it's used so often. And, and, and if you know anything about kids, here's what you know. It starts early. If you've got little kids or you've had little kids, they're, they're going to ask why uh, ad nauseum until you're like, I can't take it anymore. But if you give a kid... A task. If you say to your kid, all right, listen, here's what I want you to do. I want you to make up your bed, clean up your room. What's the first thing they ask you? Why? It's like, why? And we, you know, in our brilliance, say things like, because I told you so, right? Because I said so. That's why you do it, because that's what you do. Well, kids love to ask why. And so I, was, I, I saw this uh, commercial a while back. I love this commercial. Check this thing out. Why? Because the porch needs some work. Why? Because plants need water to grow. Why? Because baseball is played in the summer. Oxygen and hydrogen. Gravity. Because that's just the shape of my head. Because monkeys don't get married. It's complicated. Because I forgot to get a receipt. I don't know. Why? Why not? Why? Why don't you go ask your dad? Why? <laughs> that's one of my favorite commercials. I love that. So when our son Jim was about that age, he was in that why, 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 why. And, and I don't know if your kid did this or not, but when we would go like to a mall or someplace like this, Jim, it's like he had to visit the bathroom. I don't know why that is. I don't know what it was. And so he would, he, you know, Dad, I got to go to the bathroom. I'm like, oh, are you kidding me? And so I would take him into the bathroom and, uh, you know, he, he would have to sit on the stall. He's he too short, you know. So, so he's, he's sitting on the stall, close the door. The two of us are in the stall and he's like, here's, here he goes, Daddy. First question was, What's that guy doing in the stall next to us? And I'm like, 
Jim, just, just hurry up, hurry up, hurry up, hurry up. And he's sitting there, his little legs won't touch the floor, so he's got his knees on his, I mean, his elbows on his knees. And he's just sitting there, his little legs, are wet, and he looks at him like, hurry, hurry, hurry. He's like, Daddy. I'm like, what? He says, why do we breathe? And I'm like, Jim, just, let's just go. I mean, they just love to ask those questions. And here's, here's the thing. We are preconditioned early on to ask why. It's amazing because uh, why is part of our vocabulary. We want to understand. We're trying to grasp and, and know things. You know, as a pastor, I can tell you this, the number one question that I get starts with a why every time. It doesn't matter who it is. When somebody comes to see me, there's usually a why that precedes what they want to know. You know the one I get the most often? It's why did you leave the law practice to enter the ministry? You know, I mean, and people are interested in that. And so, but, but the number two question that I'll get often is this. Why did God let this happen? Why did this happen to me? Why me, Lord, out of all these people? I mean, you know, I've been doing the right things. Why me? The other questions that I'll hear often that start with a why is, why do I have to go through this? I mean, why is this so painful? Why, why can't I get over this? You know, why, why, doesn't it, why doesn't my pain go away? I get questions like that all the time, and the why is the heart of it. Why is the most powerful word in any language? It's the most powerful word in the world. Well, uh, years ago I read a book, and uh, I was very moved by this book. It's a book, some of you may have seen his TED Talk. It's a guy named Simon Sinek. He wrote a book called Start With Why. And listen to this quote, it's probably one of my most favorite, uh, favorite quotes. People don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. I mean, it's an amazing book. You really should read this because the whole concept there is, you know, it's not what you do that, that people are impressed with. It's not what you do that, that inspires others. It's why you do it. I mean, what's, what's your reason? What, why do you get out of bed in the morning and why should anybody care, he says. I mean, why is the most important question of all. And he says we need to start with the why because the why will drive our how down the road. And, and so this is, this is where this whole concept came to me from. So, so I want you to think about this today. You probably have never thought about it before, but you need to. Here it is. What's your why? What is your why? I mean, have you ever thought about it? Why do you do what you do? Whether it's, whether it's you know, work or whether it's retirement or whether it's you're a student at school. I mean, why are you doing what you're doing? Most people focus on the what instead of the why. Um, there's a story in the Bible about a man who had a big why. I want you to hear it today. It's the story of Nehemiah. Now, here's the thing about Nehemiah. It's in Old Testament. I, if you've studied the Bible at all or if you've heard a little bit of the history of the Bible, you're going to know that Nehemiah is most famous for his what. And his what, people think of Nehemiah, what did Nehemiah do? Who here knows? What did he do? What was the main, main thing he did? What he did? He rebuilt the walls around Jerusalem. And so that's his what. But the question is, what was his why? And so I want you to listen to that as we read these words today. Here we go. It's in Nehemiah 1, 1 through 4. Uh, look along with me. These are the memoirs of Nehemiah, son of Hakaliah. I love that word, Hakaliah. If you're too close, you got some on you. Sorry about that. Hakaliah. It's like, hey, anybody looking for a name for your baby that's about to be born? How about Hakalia? Hakalia. I've been looking, I've been so excited about saying that word. Hakalia. In late autumn, in the month of Kislev, and we got all kinds of big names here. In the twentieth year of King Artaxerxes' reign, I talking about Nehemiah. I was at the for fortress of Susa. Now, Susa is not in Jerusalem; it is in Babylon. This is where. Um, uh, Nehemiah was born. This is where he was raised. This is, so he's not in the promised land at all. Look what it says. Hananiah, one of my brothers, came to visit me with some other men who had just arrived from Judah. Judah, Jerusalem. They just come over and they're visiting with him. And look what it says. I asked them about the Jews who had returned there from captivity and about how things were going in Jerusalem. That's a good question. Look what they said. Things are not going well for those who return to the province of Judah. They are in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem has been torn down and the gates have been destroyed by fire. Listen to his response. He was so moved by what he heard from these friends who had come from the Holy Land, who had come from Jerusalem. Here's what he says. When I heard this, I sat down and wept. 
I mean, he was so overcome by the emotion of the disgrace and what he heard about Jerusalem that he sat down and wept. In fact, it says, for days I mourned, fasted, and prayed to the God of heaven. Well, what's your why? Here's the interesting thing about the why. We're preconditioned. We are wired early on to ask why. But here's what happens. As we grow up, you know what becomes our most uh, often used word? It's what? It's what? So, so here's an example. If you, if you meet somebody now, a lot, of, a lot of guys do this. I guess girls do too. Um, here, here's what we do. If we meet somebody the first time and we're getting to know them, we're like, so what do we ask them? What do you do? What do you do? Or, or, or if it's somebody that's retired, we'll say, hey, what did you do for a living? You know, we, we want to know their what, because here's why. Because we, we have been taught as we get older that it's the what that gives us value. You know, what we do for a living, who we are, you know, what our status is, or, or what we have, or what we've accumulated. I mean, so, so the what becomes, it, it takes the place of the why for some reason. Well, what do you do? We ask people because we think that's where the value is found in the what. But listen, listen to this. Jesus was way more interested in the why than he was in the what. I mean, all you got to do is read some of the stories in the Bible and the New Testament. If you'll just ask the rich young ruler who had a lot of what, Jesus wasn't interested in his what. He was interested in the why. I mean, ask the woman who was caught in adultery that Jesus met when they were getting ready to stone her. I mean, the what was adultery, right? Jesus wasn't interested in that. He really wanted to know why she was doing what she was doing. And, and then you can take other folks in, in the Bible. I mean, the Pharisees, Jesus was always on the Pharisees. You know why? Because their why wasn't right. They were full of what, but very little why. Um, just ask the disciples. I mean, why would somebody give up a pretty good living as a fisherman or a tax collector and follow Jesus. Jesus was interested not in their what, but in their why. The why is what motivates us. It's what drives us. It's what gives us, gets us out of bed in the morning to, to do what we want to do. It's what gives us the passion that we find sometimes in our lives. People don't buy what you do. They buy why you do it. So Jesus wanted us to think about the why. Nehemiah had a why. And I want to dig in on that just a minute. But here's what we start with here. Everybody, every person has a why. You may have never thought about your why, ever. But I want you to know this. You have a why. Now, experts will say this. They'll say that you're, you probably knew your why by age 13. We got anybody here under age 13? You're getting close to knowing your why. Most of us probably had some inspiration, something that moved us to the point where we sat down and wept. Maybe not literally, but somehow inside there was something going on and, and we knew and, and, and it was like the heart was just beating faster when we thought about it. Everybody has a why. It, it's significant. Whether you are an individual, every single person has it. Whether you are an organization, your business, whatever it is, you've got a why. You probably... Sometimes couch it in a vision statement or something like that. And, and sometimes we don't really articulate our whys. But everybody has one. Um, whether you are a church or a law firm or a teacher, whatever it is, you've got a why. Listen to Nehemiah's why. It was in verse 3. It says, things are not going well for those who return. They are in great trouble and disgrace. And he says he sat down and he wept. I mean, you should fill in that blank. He sat down and wept. He was so moved by it. You know, it became his why, and he had to do something about it. That's what gave him passion. That's what drove him. Somebody's got to restore grace. They've got to restore it to God's people because this is who we are. And so he set out every morning when he got up, that was his why. We're going to restore this dignity and grace to the people of God, the children of God. We've got to remove that disgrace and trouble. So here's what's so interesting about that. I mentioned it a few minutes ago. Nehemiah wasn't born there. He'd never seen the walls in their glory. He, you know, he did, all he had heard was what they looked like. He'd never actually been there. And so here's the beauty of Nehemiah's story. He wept for somebody else's pain. You know, it was those who were the living there who were in great trouble and who were in disgrace. He had a pretty good life going on where he was in captivity. But it was somebody else's pain 
that caused him to sit down and weep. So here's the question. Whose pain have you wept for? I mean, somebody else's pain, somebody else's great trouble, somebody else's distress. Who's, whose pain have you been weeping for? It's, it's why your why is important. I mean, what keeps you up at night that troubles you so much because you're so concerned about something else in the world? Maybe your why is found there. It's important. Have you discovered yours yet? So here's the second point I want to get across today. Significance is found in our why. It's found in our why. Uh, Simon Sinek, he's got a lot of great quotes. I love this guy. I'm telling you, you should check out his TED Talk if you haven't on this, this start with why. Working hard for something we don't care about is called stress. Does that make sense to you? Working hard for something we love is called passion. And, and let me tell you about passion. Passion comes from feeling like you're a part of something greater, something bigger, something more magnificent, something more powerful, something more meaningful than your own existence. That's what gives us passion. It, it's a bigger story. It's a greater thing that we are part of, something bigger than ourselves. That's where passion comes from. So let me go back to the question I get asked the most. Why did you leave the law to enter the ministry? And, and I, can, I can kind of summarize it fairly quickly. You know, here, here's the thing. I loved practicing law. I mean, I really did. Debbie knows. I mean, I loved it. I, I, you know, I got to travel around and try cases all around. I loved it. Got to meet a lot of people, uh, make a lot of friends. But as we lived into this for some 20 years, something was missing, we discovered. It's really interesting. Debbie noticed it before I did. She actually uh, would say to me, I think God's maybe calling you into ministry. And, you know, I would, I would push it off. And, but there was, a, there was a holy discontent. I wonder, have you ever felt that? Like there's just something not right. There's just a little something missing here. And, and, and I need to explore that when that rises up within us because it's usually God speaking in some way. It's usually some kind of Holy Spirit moment where God is saying, maybe you need to think about your why you're doing what you're doing. And so we, we experience that. And, uh, you know, when I talk about significance as found in your why, here's what I don't want you to think because I'm not saying this at all. I'm not suggesting that significance was not found in my uh, time practicing law. I believe it was. Uh, in fact, uh, I had a I had, significance can definitely be found in, in practicing law and in any occupation that we may be involved in. I, I had a, a doctor friend in Dublin. He when he heard that I was leaving the law to enter the ministry, he says, "But Jimmy, you, you know we need good Christian lawyers." I guess he probably knows a lot of lawyers. I don't know. It's like, we need good Christian lawyers. And I'm like, we do. He says, so then why don't you just stay a lawyer? And I'm like, because I can't. Because I can't. And, and let me take you back to the bull with the gate. You're like wondering, where's that story fitting in here? Here's what happened. The bull with the gate on his head. I mean, he's running all through town with all this fire truck, police car, sheriff's car, you know, mayor, all of them are riding behind him, and, and people are coming down the street. And, and here, the reason they were following along behind him is because they knew if they tried to rope him and pull him in, that the stress of what he was going through would probably cost him his life. And, and so they were just waiting for things to kind of calm down. And, and they eventually caught the bull and carried him to the uh, vet's office, and they got the... the gate off of his head and they put him in a little corral out there to let him kind of calm down because he was very very stressed well listen he didn't make it he died and the reason that he died was because of all the stress and, and so as I begin to think about my why a little bit more this past week as I'm thinking about this this message here's what I thought about I thought about the bull and, and I thought that you know what there's so much stress in life I mean, in some ways, a lot of us are running around town with a gate on our head, even though people can't see it because the stress is so strong that it can literally cost us our lives. And, and so here's, here's what I thought. I wrote it down this week. You know, what, what if we could do something about that? You know, what, what if there was a, a way to ease the stress that a lot of us feel and that people, maybe not in this room, but outside of this room now in the world, in, in our city, in our community, they're, they're under so much stress. They're under so much pressure. And, and maybe some of them are doing it by choice. Some of the others are doing it because it just, it just happens. But what if we could do something about it? 
I mean, what if we could tell them, you don't have to live like that anymore? What what if we could tell them there's hope? And and, and the hope, we believe, because we're here, is not found within ourselves. It's found in something greater than ourselves. So what if if God gave us passion for all of those folks who are running around town with a gate on their head? And, and, And let me just suggest to you that that's where my why lies. It's there in that space. I mean, what if people didn't have to feel like that? What if they knew there's hope and it comes from Jesus Christ? And Jesus Christ died so that we can be with God the Father ultimately. But Jesus Christ also came so that we can live this life without that. And so I tell people all the time, I say, listen, if you can just move a little bit closer to Christ... I mean, that's kind of my heart cry, too. If I can help people move just a, one little step closer to Christ. Listen, every time you move a little bit closer to Christ, your life's going to get better. Now, don't hear it wrong. It doesn't mean you're still not going to feel like a bull sometimes with a gate on your head. But listen, you're going to be able to manage it better. Your, your, your family's going to be stronger. Your marriage is going to be stronger. Your finances are going to come together as you listen to God lead you there. If we can just move a little bit closer to Christ. And here's the beauty of this little thought is that everybody can take another step closer to Christ. I can. You can. So what if God might use us to do something like that? That's, that's my why. And, it, and it's caught in this passage uh, in Philippians 1.10. I read this a, a few weeks back, and I'm like, you know what? I'm thinking about why. Listen to it. It says, I want you to understand what really matters so that you may live a pure and blameless life until the day of Christ's return. It's like, we need to understand. I need to help people know what really matters. And listen, that's it. That Christ gives us hope. He gives us the power to live this life, not as those who are overwhelmed with stress, but as those who are not surviving but thriving, even now. So there's my why. You know, here's where it comes from, too. Our why originates from what we believe. I mean, you're here today, I think, because you believe this whole story of Jesus Christ and what he does for us. That's why you gather here each week so that we can worship him. And so in 2 Corinthians, Paul puts it this way. He says, for Christ's love compels us. It's like we don't have an option here. We are compelled to do what we do because we are convinced that those who live, watch that, should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. So I've given you a lot to think about today, hadn't I? But what's your why? Listen, listen. you ought to sit down with your spouse. You ought to sit down with your parents, or you ought to sit down with your buddies, and you ought to say, you know what? I'm trying to understand my why. Would you help me? Tell me what I'm passionate about. And people will tell you. Sometimes they'll say things you're a little surprised. You're, oh, you're, you're passionate about the Georgia Bulldogs. I am. I'm passionate about them. Or you're passionate about, you know, looking the best you can look. Or you're passionate about other people. And it just, it just oozes out of you. And there's your why. So, so I got a little blank, couple of blanks there for you. It's, uh, you know, to, to blank, so that blank. If you were to write out your why, it would be the, the blank. The first blank is my contribution. It's like what I'm doing. This is, this, is my, this is my how, this is my what. I'm doing this so that the impact is the why. I mean, there it is. And so you can put it in a statement and you can understand that. Here, here's the thing. If you're, if you're thinking, like I thought for a long time, that my why was to have a good job so that I could pay bills and live a good life, it, it, I would have probably said the why is my money. I mean, you know, I got to pay for all this stuff. I got to take care of my kid. I got to take care of my wife. I mean, come on. It's money. But listen, money is not your why. It's the byproduct of your what. So it's your why that drives you. It's your why that gives you passion. So your how will bring life to your why. That's what happens when you understand your why. And so what if uh, you could write it down? What if if you could talk about it and share it? What What if you could... But then begin to express it to others. When you do, listen to what happens. People are inspired because people don't buy what you do. They buy why you do it. They're inspired. They want to be a part of it. They want to, they want to, they want to own it with you. So I want to encourage you to do that. 
to discover it and to share it with your spouse, your kids, your grandkids, and, and then encourage them to, to discover their own why. What's your why? What's your why? We're going to dig in a little bit further in the next few weeks. Uh, I'm very excited about this series. Here's some next steps for you, though, this week. Uh, I will discover, spend some time, I will discover or rediscover my why. He, here's, here's what I want you to hear also. You may be in a place where you're like, I'm just going through the motions in my job. I don't really like my job. It's not the best thing for me, but this is what I'm doing right now. You know, um, there are studies that show that 80% of the people will say that their current job is not their ideal job. But here's, here's what I want you to hear. You don't need another what. You need to discover or rediscover your why. And so I want to encourage you to do that this week. I'll talk to somebody about my why. I would like to know more. If you'd like to know more about how to discover your why or rediscover your why, I'd be happy to share that with you. Jamie would be happy to share that with you. Uh, and then I always want to encourage you to invite somebody to come to, uh, to worship here uh, with us at Park Avenue. Um, why is the most powerful word in the world? Jesus is more interested in your why than your what. Nehemiah had a why. You and I have a why. Jesus had a why. His why was pretty clear, wasn't it? I mean, not many of us are going to miss his why. His why was so that we might be reconciled to the Father. He came to earth so that he might take our place on a cross, take away our sins, give us life, give us hope. And here's the thing. Once he came and that why began to come, become evident, there was an explosion that occurred of people wanting to follow him. His why was crystal clear to provide a way. His how was on a cross. And nobody expected that. Nobody did. 